Hello everyone, welcome to Agile 2022. Agile's motto this year is green innovation, young leaders tackling climate change. And today I'm talking with Dr. Amel Kabul. So thank you Amel for joining us today. Uh, maybe to introduce you, uh, your background and uh, what you're doing. You're the CEO of the Education Outcome Fund, an organization that aims to transform education worldwide by tying funding to measurable results. You are also the commissioner of the International Commission on Financing Global Education Opportunity, the Education Commission. You are also a social entrepreneur, chairwoman, author, and also a politician. You are also a former minister. You are appointed as a minister of tourism. You are the first woman to hold this position from January 2014. Uh, and that ended in 2015 with a successful uh, transitional phase uh, of the government. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, maybe just to add uh, one more thing here, you published a book called uh, Coffin Corner, outlining a new leadership culture suited to the complexity and dynamics of the 21st century. So maybe we can start uh, with this book. I mean, the book focuses on leadership and you have this very intriguing title, Coffin Corner. I mean, what exactly, I mean, what exactly, how did you come up with this title? And what are you trying to say with this title? And in connection to this, what exactly is leadership? How is leadership defined in this book? Hi, th thanks for, first of all, for inviting me. I'm happy really to be here. And uh, yeah, Coffin Corner is, is a metaphor, basically, that comes from aviation. And being, a, you know, uh, an engineer from Karlsruhe, I'm like a German engineer. <laughs> it had to come from an engineering background, I guess. But it's, it's an image that actually when the higher you fly a plane, um, you know, the uh, less obviously resistance you have from the air and, and, um, but also, you know, you need, so you can basically save, let's say on fuel, uh, but also the higher you, fr you fly, kind of the velocity changes that it could become also unstable. And so um, there is, and, and, you know, there is a kind of a maximum height where both optimization of fuel speed uh, velocity and different um, things in the plane come together. And if you go above that, um, then you basically risk uh, completely a fatal destruction and, and fall. And so the corner before that kind of maximum point is called the coffin corner, actually, in aviation. There was a sadly tragic accident also where I think an Air France fl flight fell in the Atlantic. So it's in a way in metaphor of, yes, you can be super optimized, but you don't really have a lot of maneuvering space for unexpected things that can happen. Uh, and so the whole book talks about how over the last century, maybe we have been optimizing and, and you know, you know, kind of looking for, for, for everything from a very technical um, kind of reduced complexity lens, uh, be it in economics, politics and elsewhere. And that actually at the moment, we, we really need a different form of leading organizations, which allows for space for uncertainty and it's a very storytelling approach because um you know leadership is as much as an art as it is you know technology if you want to say it like that uh, or, or or a handcraft um and so it's a very storytelling because i think stories are the way how we can convey values and how we can convey how things um kind of implicit ways of dealing um come across much easier than a formula. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's very interesting uh, that you connect leadership in this uh, aviation uh, technical kind of ideas. So what, what does this tell us about leadership? I mean, how then, what should leaders do in connection to your argument in the book on Coffin Corner? Yeah, I mean, it's a very big question. And I mean, leadership research has been ongoing forever from, you know, the great man theories um, that were most, mostly white uh, male, um, you know, from, you know, Napoleon to, to Lincoln and things like that, to much more modern leadership theories, 
uh, which are like transformational leadership, authentic collective leadership. So um, <clears throat> it's interesting also to see how our society and our values change. For me personally, I've been very engaged in mindfulness over the recent years and kind of linking that to being an authentic leader. An authentic leader is for me someone who has high self-awareness about themselves, um, others and, and their environment, and also are well able to self-regulate both their emotions, their relationship, and 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 to be able to be present um, to whatever happens. And so I do think that that's really relevant for nowadays. One, we can see all the scandals, both in the business world and, and in politics, sadly, um, of this kind of lack of moral and, and value-driven leadership. Uh, but also on the other side, I believe that leadership is not a position anymore. It's a process. And so it has to be everyone is in an organization for me as a leader because they can just kick off a process. Sometimes you can be the technical person who deals with the customer. So like in a hierarchy type of thing, the lowest may be in the hierarchy, but you have the most important information. And so um, how can we have a collective, collaborative leadership um, that still obviously reaches results. And, and, and for me, mindfulness has been something that I personally practiced, but that, that I also teach and, and used to coach other leaders um, because I think it's a very powerful tool, um, not, at least not to dump our own stuff <laughs> and unresolved issues from whatever, childhood, adulthood, from our life onto decisions that we make as leaders, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I really like that definition of uh, leadership is not only about a position, but also everyone can be a leader in uh, every position or anywhere. So you are also a leader mm -hmm. in different areas of your life. What challenges do you face and how do you overcome those challenges? Yeah, it's another <clears throat> very big question. I mean... Um, if I think professionally right now at the Education Outcomes Fund, we're really challenging the status quo because um, just of a bit of background, you know, we before COVID, we were already failing half of the world children. So the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal for to have quality education for every child by 2030, uh, we, it looked like we're going to fail half of the world children. We are not going to be achieve it. Now, after COVID, it's even worse. Um, I think in low and middle income countries right now, 70% of the children cannot read a sentence for meaning at the end of primary school by age 10, 70%. I mean, this is the biggest silent pandemic in the world, I feel, um, that very not enough people talk about. And so we came in and to say, let's, let's try something different. You know, we've been spending a lot of money. I mean, we do need to spend more money in education. But we have to admit also there is a lot of waste and inefficiencies. And if we are failing so many children, can we do it in a different way? And so we brought the words of finance with the word of, you know, partnership with the word of impact investing, with the word of development, with the word of education and governments and civil society and, and kind of in a new concept where we move the attention on outcomes and results for children rather than on spending money for activities and because you know most governments in the world they you know you spend your budget if you don't spend your budget you don't get it the next year so they're incentivized actually to spend budget rather than to achieve results and so i think one big challenge is when you challenge the status quo obviously the status quo hits back <laughs> and so it's it's you know convincing people to try something new to try something unfamiliar, maybe not yet 100% proven. Um, it's it's quite a feast, but it's, it's super motivating because then you find those champions in the different governments, like now in Sierra Leone or Ghana or the UK government or the Swiss government. So these are four who have been saying, yes, we are not happy with the status quo. Let's try something different because we want to have better results for our children. So you find those champions that walk with you, but it's still a very uphill struggle. So I would say professionally, that's 
that's one of the biggest challenges I'm facing is convincing people to try things differently than the way we've been doing it so far. So how, what do you think? I mean, you work with uh, internationally, you come from the African continent, you've worked with uh, Africans. Do you see such, um, such characteristics in African young people? And if so, is there anything maybe European young leaders or German young leaders can learn from African leaders, maybe generally, but also in terms of business? Yeah. I mean, it's very big generalization. You know, Africa is a very big continent and it's often depicted very small. I have always this picture where I think the whole of Europe, the whole of North America, you know, kind of South, part of South America and Asia all fit within the African continent. So um, I, I'm, I would be careful to, to make generalizations um, there. But um, I mean, definitely, which I think is there, I think there is a lot of innovation in the continent. And in a way, because we are a bit freer, like the legacy is sometimes lower. Like one example is, is a close friend and a, a hero of mine is, is Fred Swanicker, who is Ghanaian, uh, but who, who built the African Leadership Group, starting with the African Leadership Academy in South Africa and then the universities in Rwanda and Mauritius and now, um, you know, kind of the next phase of ALX where his vision is to build the next 3 million, lead, you know, African leaders. And it's interesting when we have the conversation, he could build those universities that are completely innovative, where the first year you don't study a topic, but you know you you, you study about yourself, project management, data, etc. Because he doesn't have the legacy. I think a university like Oxford or Harvard, they have much more legacy. They're much more, you know, uh, you know, they are much less risk taking because you know there is a lot to preserve and so in a way when there is less to preserve you can take more risks and bring more innovation so for example he's for me someone who's revolutionizing higher education and um, so I think like maybe the newest innovations will come from that continent and and I think that often uh, Europeans or, or kind of Westerners underestimate that and and I have an example from Tunisia you know, where um, now they are like really a big company, but but Rudin Welly, who founded Vermeg, um, told me like stories about you know them participating in RFPs. So they were like a software company for financial institutions, and I'm not going to say which European country when when you know when they said a central bank of the country wanted that, and when people in the panel saw a company from Tunisia, they're like, oh, that's a joke, you know. And so they didn't take the company. And what, what he did then is actually he bought a failing IT company, I think, from Belgium or so, um, you know, and then became a Belgian company. And then they started winning, you know, uh, our, you know these proposals. And but there were the same people with the same thing. And so you see how much innovation is sometimes lost. Or, or another example from Morocco, a big, you know, um, insurance company that started in Africa, grew an alliance had the chance to buy them and they didn't. And now they think it's one of the biggest mistakes they've made not to make this acquisition, you know? So um, so I do think that there is a lot of innovation, but I think there is a lot of colonialism in that sense that people do underestimate Africans and, and their innovations and their ideas. And we still sometimes sadly have to be in London or New York or wherever to kind of or have our companies there registered or hire people who look, you know, like that to, to be able to win uh, big deals. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's really unfortunately. Um, maybe let's talk a little bit about uh, female leadership. I mean, you're a woman, you've done so many things. And as we know, Despite, I mean, nowadays uh, women are rising in different positions, but still, they are still a minority. Maybe first of all, how did you achieve to do what you did? And is there anything you're doing to support other women to pursue different uh, leadership roles in their different areas of their lives? Yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, we are, I mean, Statistically, we're still 100 years away from equality, but let's hope we can manage to do that faster. 
for our daughters and the next generation. So um, I think I grew up in a family of where at least my, my father always was, a fa- he proudly said I'm a feminist, you know? So, and, and so I was very supported by my parents to pursue education, obviously, and, and, and higher education. Um, and then in a way, learning to deal with a lot of adversity probably made me who I am. As you can imagine, being you know a Muslim Arab woman, and I started my career in Germany in the automotive industry, where it was mainly male, Christian, white. You know, it's kind of really um, there was a big gap. Um, I do offer actually a workshop, kind of a three-hour workshop. It's kind of as a hobby. It's called Fighting Dragons and Monsters, <laughs> which is both for female and, and male leaders, and we look at what are the main dragons and monsters that are hindering um, you know, women from attaining high leadership positions? And some of them are internal. Um, you know, like uh, there is a moment always in this workshop that gets very emotional. So I explain a bit the outer dragons. Um, maybe, maybe let's move there first. So one of the outer dragons is uh, men are, are often you know, um, perceived or looked at their potential. Versus women look at performance. Let's say you wanna you're in a company and you want to promote someone for marketing global, and then you will have a conversation that goes like this without people being aware. It's very kind of an unconscious bias, you know. So you talk about CVs and you say, Oh, Peter, he was leading marketing in Germany. We think he has the potential, he could become head of global germ global marketing. And then maybe like 20 minutes later, there is a CV of you know Alina or something like that, and people say, Oh, she's had, you know, marketing in Italy. She's done this really great, great performance. Maybe she should lead France before she take global marketing, you know? So um, it's it's kind of, and, and that's that's one thing which is an outer dragon. And the other outer dragon is that actually likability and success are positively correlated for men and negatively correlated for women, which means like the more successful you are, the more people like you, the more people vote for you, as a man, the more successful you are as a woman without any of your doing, the less liked you are, you know, the less, you know, so, um, and, and so I think one part I help female leaders and also male leaders who want to support female leaders is to understand those outer monsters and dragons, that these are societal, um, conscious and unconscious biases. And so, for example, instead of spending so much time trying to be like, because if you know you're not going to be like, is kind of creating a small group of supporters, friends, but also constructive critics, and then live with the fact that you're going to have a lot of backlash and a lot of, you know, headwind, you know. Um, And so then we move then in the workshop to the inner dragons, which is like things. So as I said, there is always a moment after I talk about all these outer dragons and then I say, okay, um, what is the thing that you feel is still kind of hindering you in your life? And I've done this workshop with like, I did it with the CFOs of Fortune 500. I did it with women leaders in China. I did it like, you know, with, with really top women leaders. And I did it with like, adolescent girls in a in a quite disadvantaged school here in North London. And the interesting, the results are the same. So I asked them to write on pieces of paper and I put it in a brown bag. I call it the brown bag of burden. And then I take them out and read them loud. So no one and, and it's always like I'm not good enough. Uh, I'm not good mother enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not thin enough. I'm not that enough. And it's interesting that you have a CFO of a DAX company saying, I'm not good enough, and a 13-year-old girl from a marginalized community saying, I'm not good enough. So it's not like there is not really that big difference. And it's often a very emotional moment because when you start reading one card after the other, there is that moment of common humanity that comes and where you know, people feel I'm not alone in this. This is something we all carry after 5,000 years of patriarchy, you know, like, or more. So in a way, and I tell tell them if you've achieved, and I remember in this school, you know, the headmaster, you know, was an amazing headmaster and he gave me actually the best girls in the school to do the workshop with. 
And these are girls who are amazing, despite coming from quite disadvantaged backgrounds. And they all had this, I'm not good enough. And, and he sat there and he had tears in his eyes and he was like, oh my God, you know? Um, and so, yeah, so that, the other things that, you know, do to make people, first of all, more aware, I think knowledge is important of the dynamics that are ongoing, but also to then find power within, but in the community with women and men to, um, to, to move the needle in, in women leadership. Yeah. Mm. So men have definitely have to take part in this, of course. Um, now maybe let's move on to talk about networks uh, as far as uh, Agile is concerned. Uh, Agile is the African-German young leadership um, network. And here German leaders, African young leaders try to meet, to network, work together, you know, so what do you think about such type of networks? Maybe you have been in such type of networks. How can such networks facilitate, um, yeah, facilitate um, learning from each other and developments in different fields of our lives? No, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big believer in these. I mean, I've one that really influenced me is is the BMW Foundation Responsible Leader Network, which is completely independent from the company, by the way, BMW, but run as a foundation. Um, and for me, it was a network that I joined, you know, early in my career and where I met, you know, amazing young leaders from, you know, um, the third, you know, civil society, from politics, from policy, from businesses. and it's it's a great opportunity to to brainstorm ideas together to help each other achieve one's you know goals to get to know yourself better by mirroring you know what others doing and and you know engaging in deeper conversations um and so there are different things but as i said before i think to be successful in networks you have to give you know you have to your time, you have to give your network, you help people. If someone asks a question, you help. So do you know someone? Do you know something? And I think people don't underestimate this. They think, oh, network, I go and I get. Yeah, you will get. I mean, it's interesting because when I joined that network, I was in the private sector for many years. And then I went to government. And after government, actually, I joined a, a nonprofit and, 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 and leading it. And I think my first three big grants came from people from that network that I've joined, you know, kind of many, many, many years ago. And I would say for the first four years of me in that network, I've been only in the giving position. Like I've, I've, I've joined workshop where people had strategy, helped them to think through it. I've gave contacts. I've helped with free coaching. I've, you know, done a lot of things. And actually, then when I needed it, it was there and I got a lot of support. And so um, that was amazing to experience. So in the context of Agile, we have African young leaders from several African countries coming together with German young leaders. Yeah. What, what could these young leaders give to each other? I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, you've mentioned an example on how you gave and you received back later on in such a network. What do you think? I mean, what can be, what can these leaders give each other in such kind of networks? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of currency. There is, you know, if, if, you know, peer coaching, if someone says I'm working on this and I need, you know, ideas, then you sit with three, four other people, especially if they are from a different context, they give you ideas. You can give each other contacts. You know, everyone is separated by anyone in the world with like, you know, different degrees of separation, but, um, you know, um, yeah, kind of other networks, um, you know, even sometimes having just a deeper conversation to challenge my own thinking could be something I give or receive in such a network, you know. So um, sometimes, I mean, I've often seen, I think there is a magic that happens when you bring the right people together. I've seen companies starting. I, I've seen organizations starting. I've seen movements starting and being very successful of, out of such networks, you know, so global movement, I'm not talking like tiny things, you know, so um, I have a strong belief when you bring the right people together, but then you have to facilitate it in a way that is not 
you know, keynote speeches at plenary. And so, but, you know, giving them enough space to be interactive and to work together, then the right things will appear. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's nice that you mentioned that because it also reminds me of Agile last year because uh, uh, participants had to sit together and come up with an idea. And there were so many innovative ideas which were created out of, you know, different people coming together from different backgrounds and at the same time creating a very, very innovative idea. So I completely agree with you on the benefits of such networks. So Agile's motto this year is green innovation, young leaders tackling climate change. So it's about climate change and green innovation. Where do you see the potential, the potential in African-German collaborations to meet the challenges of climate change? As far as the I mean, for me, I, I, I mean, there is obviously all the technological innovations and, you know, the things around COP and NDCs, et cetera, what people are working in. I think for me, climate change still has been a very masculine endeavor so far to try to solve. And masculine, not in terms of male, because I think male and female, like we both women and men, we all have masculine and feminine parts in us. But it's a very masculine, male-dominated technological conversation. And truth is that maybe I call it with solar roof and electric cars, we can maybe, maybe half emissions by 2030. But if we really want to achieve net zero by 2050, we basically have to relearn how to live on this earth. And, and part of that is you know, has to do with climate justice. We have to understand that the rich have to pay for it. And the rich, I mean, globally as the rich countries and nationally as the rich within countries. It's just, you know, it's, 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 it shows always those who produce the most are suffering the least, um, both globally, but also within countries. And I think if the narrative, so the narrative is something that needs to change um, or on who's going to pay for, for that. And secondly, how can they help empower young people? So PISA is going to this year coming out in December, we'll have also the green and the climate part of it. And I had the privilege kind of a sneak peek on, on, the, on, on some of the pre-results and conversations with the OECD. And, and what comes very clearly also since few studies is that young people, okay, the understanding, I mean, the awareness is there, yeah that something needs to happen. The understanding is mixed, but the sense of being empowered, the sense of being able to act is very low. So young people basically nowadays know that's the problem. Some know what it is, and then most of them feel completely disempowered. Like, I know, but what can I do, you know? And so I think that's what we need to change as a collective. So moving away from it to being purely technical problem solving to a really kind of the mindset change, the learning to live on this is, and empowering young people, not by teaching them yet another subject at school, but I mean, there are some innovators out there who do action climate projects in schools. And, you know, so working on that side of mindset and change and transformation, that will be really key if we ever want to achieve net zero. That's something that I'd love to see the agile young leaders um, involved in. Hmm. And what do you think about relations among among nations? I mean, such as I mean, in this context of agile, we have African countries, several African countries coming together with German young ladies. Do you think uh, such networks can also facilitate maybe, um, yeah, relations among nations? I mean, of course, in this context, not like state to state, but really towards the young people, I mean, the real people on, in the countries. I mean, what do you think about such potentials as far as Agile is concerned? Well, I think it's huge. I don't think there is a relationship between states. Relationships are always between people, you know? And I think people totally underestimate that as well. Like they think sometimes big global things happen because some people have a big strategy. I mean, in a negative way, sometimes I think conspiracy theory. And I was like, no one has actually the time to develop such conspiracy theories in the back doors of politics or wherever, but of power. Um, there is a complete overestimation of these things. But I've seen myself, like how big decisions are made 
and often, you know, around, you know, dinner table or, you know, if you go to UN General Assembly, nothing happens actually in the official pieces. It's all about, you know, breakfasts and dinners and lunches and meetings and, and walks and whatever. Um, and you can see when you invest in the relationships you can achieve and, and not in a negative sense of, you know, like, oh, this is corrupt or because it's, a, it's you know, you're giving to your father or cousin or whatever. For me, like high performance, a high transparency and things are the basic. But if you take, you know, two initiatives that are both, you know, both worthy, um, then the one could succeed more because you have stronger relationships with people. So relationships are everything, you know, and, and you can have now two people who are young leader having a relationship who tomorrow are going to be, you know, two heads of states or two CEOs of big organizations. And because they know each other, they will create something together that would have not been created before, you know. So um, I do think sometimes there is a lot of negative talk about all these networks and clubs and stuff. And yes, it's just a tool. You can do it badly. But there is also, I've seen a lot of good happening as you reach out to people and say, you know, I'm now leading this big organization. Or when I was in government, I was like, we are leading this massive transition. The whole world is watching us. I need you to help. And I've reached out to a few people all over the world and they all stepped up and helped. Uh, yeah, I mean, and that's that's exactly the, the aim of Agile. And um, maybe now let's talk about education. Huh? This is your very, this is a very important topic to you. And I watched your TED talk and I was so touched by what you said. I mean, you said that the most important infrastructure we have educated minds uh, and you criticized that people don't need education but they need to learn you, you said that we are facing a global learning crisis and i found these statements are very very strong and uh, listening to your talk further i saw you one of the pilot countries is tanzania by the way i'm from tanzania so i was i was very happy to hear that um, you did, I mean, you chose Tanzania as one of those uh, pilot projects and you saw increasing in terms of uh, learning. So, yeah, what's your opinion? I mean, you talk about learning and how can we prepare maybe young people to become leaders in the future? I mean, is there like a specific strategy which you can provide on how maybe young people, even maybe especially girls, can be prepared you know, to take various positions in the future, to take big leadership roles in the future. Yeah, I'm a big believer what we technically call progressive universalism, which is mainly means you, you kind of, as a government also, you pay more for earlier years, you know, so it means like investing in early childhood education, because this is where already a lot of the inequality happens. And this is, by the way, a lot of where the learning also happens, you know, and so, you know, in, in having children play, um, you know, they learn, they learn actually all the 21st century skills, like you don't have to reskill actually young people, if you give them the right early childhood development and education in in a form of, you know, creative thinking and, you know, flexibility, resilience, a lot of things you can learn up to the age of five, you know, and um, and then obviously, you know, it con learning should continue. But if you look at actually most countries, even a country like Germany, which is like, I think, completely insane, to be honest. And I've lived a while there and I have my two daughters were born there, is that to have high quality early childhood care, you pay so much money. And then the top universities are free, which is basically creates more inequality. So it means like it's it's one of the few actually OECD countries where the education of your parents still has a massive correlation with how, how far your education also goes. And so for me, this is completely skewed. You know, like the the I think we should spend a lot of money in early childhood, the early and the younger years. And then in the later years, you know, young people can have scholarships, they can, you know, take clothes. And, and like there is different ways um, where, you know, you can, if you're bright, you can kind of thrive in your later years. But investing more in the early years so that you beat, you know, um, the postcode that you come from that could be a disadvantage or 
the family background you come from, etc. You don't beat those at university, you know. Uh, you beat those in early years, and so I'm 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 definitely a big believer of that. And I think we need a massive change globally here to uh, yeah empower boys and girls to to you know to a more fulfilled life. Okay, thank you. So maybe let's finalize with some personal questions. <laughs> Um, do you have an inspirational motto for yourself? I mean, is there anything which you believe in? Is there anything which you tell yourself every day? I mean, do you have like an inspirational motto? Yeah, I think to be really authentic, like, is there not that saying like, be yourself, um, there are enough others who are others or something like that? I, I probably am quoting it wrong, but. Um, but in a way, yeah, in a way for me, like personal development, personal self-awareness and kind of being connected to my values and doing not what is easy, but what is right. I think I've always chosen, you know, when I had to choose doing what is easy or what is right, I've chosen what is right. And it came with high prices to pay sometimes personally or relationally. Uh, but I think that's how I look in the mirror and, and, and I just feel true to myself. And, um, and when you are that, like, you have to live with a certain degree, I think we have to be realistic of loneliness, which is fine. You know, like leaders, the higher the top you are, the more lonely you are in a way. Because often people don't challenge the status quo because people often don't speak out, you know, speak up, you know. And so... When you do, you may find yourself alone, but it doesn't mean you're wrong, you know. And so facing that resistance and facing that loneliness and facing that people sometimes don't join or don't speak up and be comfortable with it um, and not feeling isolated has been, I think, a good journey for me. I really like that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amel. I mean, for this interview, but also for what you're doing. I think you're an inspiration to so many people, I mean, leading organizations, sharing your knowledge with other people. Also, not only that, but also writing. I find it also very, very important. So thank you very much for what you're doing. And uh, I learned a lot from this interview and I'm sure young leaders would learn a lot uh, from this interview. So thanks for inviting me and I wish all of you <laughs> whenever you're from Germany or from our wonderful African continent. Um, yeah, great success. And, and yeah, don't forget giving. <laughs>